And we're live and live streaming with Pio today. Pio, good morning, sir. Kia ora, bro. Thanks for having me in your funny. Yeah, thanks for <laughs> um, thanks for coming. Episode number one hundred and one. I think you're the you're the third in our in our new little space. So uh, so welcome. Welcome to our little Friday. Well, good to have you here, and it's good to uh, good to be with you, bro. Thanks for uh, giving us a, a little bit of your busy time. Obviously, you're a busy man at the moment. What's going on in your world? What's happening in your life? Um, well, you know, like everybody else in Aotearoa, bro, coming out of lockdown or sort of out of a lockdown, we um, we you know things uh, things happen really quickly. I've, I'm working on a new show for Maori TV, good old Maori TV, yep. television for the intelligent, yep. um, um, which is a live chat show. <laughs> the irony. You cool. can come on my show, bro. Happy to. Um, yeah, and uh, we just shot promos last night till about midnight around Auckland City, and it was really good. We're down in Dominion Road doing some shooting, and there are lots of people out in those really cool little restaurants yeah. and down the bottom of town. So uh, there was a good feel, and, uh, and and people look good. People were smiley. People were were, were looking sharp, you know. So, um, you know, as a as a bit of a, a a tester of what's happening out there, it was good to get out and about. So yeah, you're yeah, quite busy at the moment, but it's only me, bro. So I always find something to do. <laughs> I, I always find somebody to annoy. Yeah, um, it, yeah. It's interesting the, the the lockdown situation at the moment. I being based in Dunedin, I had. Uh, like in the four weeks we were actually locked down, uh, the first two weeks I basically didn't leave the house. Um, I think I might have gone out once. And when I went out, for people who know Dunedin, we have a one-way system. And at one stage, the one-way system is four yeah. lanes. I was the only car on the four lanes in that first two weeks. And then went out a couple of times in the second two weeks and there was a few more cars in that one-way system. Yeah. And then went out kind of when we went to level three and there was it felt a bit normal. And now, like you say, going out there, there's traffic jams, which there, there weren't all the way through. So we seem to be getting back to yeah. an element of normality. I don't know. If that, I guess that's good. I was going to say whether that's good or bad, but it does appear to be to be coming. But it's it's interesting. I'm I'm so excited and so grateful. I've put a few posts on my Facebook page recently about, you know, thanks to the government, and I've been given a bit of, a bit of stick by people going, saying, no, it's not the government, it's us. It's the people who have done this. And I'm like, you know, you're right. But there is an element of leadership in this that I wanted to acknowledge as well, because like other parts of the world that haven't had the same leadership as us, the people haven't just welled up and done it themselves. So that leadership and that direction has helped from the top down. And then we as the citizens have got behind it and gone, let's get this. And it appears with my beloved Highlanders playing in about 24 hours from now, we've kind of got, got, got some sort of things that the rest of the world can't have yet, which is pretty amazing. Mate, I totally agree with you. You know, I, I you know, I, I say I, I don't get involved in politics, but you know, I am a Maori, so we're a very political race. You know, <laughs> even if it's just in the kitchen. But yeah, I love um, one of the words that I don't hear enough of is the word compassion, and I really like compassion, and I think there's room for compassion in politics. And our leader, whether you like her or not, has been compassionate. And when you look at our leadership. Um, of, of strong wahine, um, I think there's less ego and more compassion, you know, and um, and in this time, she has served us well. Not only her, um, you know, who's the guy, I, I keep thinking of Craig Little, the uh, the All Black, but it's actually Andrew Little. Right. He's never had any, any ups for actually stepping aside and let this young woman sit in the chair, you know, so... Big ups to Andrew Little. Big ups to the team that she's been clever enough to put around herself. You know, I'm a very proud Maori New Zealander, and we live in. I've always known we lived in the best country in the world, um, but we still got a chance to stuff it up. You know, so um, you know, I'm grateful that we've survived this and we're stronger day by day. So good on us, bro. Happy to be a part of the team of five million. Yeah, and and as you say, the compassion thing that from day one that be kind. Be kind, be kind, be kind was this repetitive theme, including, um, I didn't see it in Dunedin, but I saw stories about it. Yeah, you'd be driving along various motorways in New Zealand and the signs yeah. on the motorways were saying, be kind. It's just like, that's that. I mean, like you could, maybe I could get a little bit overly uh, sort of dramatic and say the the kind of motherly sort of spirit coming out and that sort of thing as well, which, which you don't seem to have seen, as you say, in maybe the male leaders we've had in the past, but... Yeah, no, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited that where we are. People have also not been criticising, but been saying, you know, 
the 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 PM is just a mouthpiece, and it's really the advisors. And my thoughts have been like that's on some level true, but still, as the PM, they have to choose to take the advice and run with it. And if you look at other parts oh, of the yeah. world, I don't know, we could say America. Um, some people there have been given advice, then as leaders shunned it. So, you know, I just I'm just so grateful for where we are and where where we are literally on the globe, and where we are as a nation right now to be able to to move forward. It's it's pretty bloody exciting. Bro, for many years we've moaned about our isolation and not being able to go, you know, to Ibiza for a hundred <laughs> from London. But now it's our now it's our ace card. And the other thing is you still go back to the be kind. You know, people I don't know what's wrong. Maybe it's this Kiwi macho attitude, which I think's bullshit to me anyway. I think the real warriors in our country are people who are doing stuff for other people mm -hmm. and and I, I i was in a situation where where i knew the person i was talking to was and rightly so hugely con concerned about our ailing economy okay yep. now i totally agree with that but the the crux of it is in the word ailing or sick if you're ailing or sick, there is a chance for recovery. Bro, if you're dead yeah. because of, of the virus, you're bloody dead, bro. Yeah. So, you know, people say, oh, you know, all you lefties and all the rest of it. I says, bro, the bottom line is that, sure, we can survive this. And when you look at uh, our economy and the way some people have pivoted, I watched the beautiful Māori woman on TV on Seven Sharp, I think, and she's lost her job. She's a solo mother. She does not want to go on the benefit, but because of her attitude, and she doesn't, um, and you know, she's going to do really well. And sometimes the tough times bring the best out of us out, and I hope that's true. Don't want to be too flippant, but you know that whole thing about uh, you need the pressure to make the diamond, you know. But with, I mean, that, that, it is a bit flippant because there are a lot of people going through a lot of crap and stuff at the yes. moment as well. But yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. I'm, I'm interested to see what happens now with our borders. I'm a little bit unclear on that because I think with the borders still having those restrictions, but people aren't having to go into like a government 14-day lockdown. I don't know. I think it's it's isolation themselves. I'm not clear on that yet. My only concern is we've worked so bloody hard. I understand we want to open yeah. up some borders, but for me, I'm like, well, let's just let's just keep the borders closed for a few more months. And then reassess yeah. because it will be horrible for, you know, clusters and stuff to pop up now because in theory the only way we can get COVID again is off an airplane. That would be the only way. That's right. So so right. I don't know. Oh, that makes me a it's, bit nervous. It's a, it's, a, it's a real juggling act, bro, for the government. Um, my my view around borders is entirely selfish. Okay. Totally. Like it's all about me. So basically. Um, I want to go to Rarotonga for a week in the middle of our winter. So totally selfish. So don't listen to me. This is bad advice. Uh, but I'm happy to spend some money there if my wife will let me go. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the concept is to have a shared bubble. So the bubble just extends between us and Australia. But as you say, at the right time. So we've got some uh, security around the fact that we're not going to get crook again, bro. Yeah. Yeah, uh, who was I speaking hey, to? I tell you what, I tell you what, I tell you what, um, I, I want to touch on on this if I may, because I'm a I'm a big. I used to be a tour guide oh, right. uh, for Con Tiki Tours, and I, yeah, and I fell in love with places like Portobello, and I used to wander around Dunedin and buy stuff from old secondhand shops. So I love that part of the world. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I tell you what's surrounding us, and because you can tell by my nose that I am a Maori, um, <laughs> is this whole thing about these monuments, bro. Yeah, I've seen that. In fact, I saw a headline. I've got my computer here. I saw a headline today. There's a few things going on. There's a there's the Maori exhibit exhibit at Canterbury Museum. They're talking about, and there was a monument. Where was it? Hamilton statue coming down. Colonial, uh, what does it say here? Hamilton City Council will remove a statue of Captain Hamilton after a formal request from Waik uh, Waikato Tainui and a man's pledge to tear it down. So, what are, you, what are your thoughts? Mate, I've got to tell you, I've got really mixed feelings about this. Um, I was listening to um, a historian, a guy called Tom, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Tom Law, and he was saying, um, and this guy's 
Maori, Maori hard, you know, to, to you know, like you southern boys, you know. <laughs> and he was, uh, he had mixed feelings about uh, tearing these things down. He, um, his main focus was to actually know the stories, to understand the stories and have the conversation. And I think he went back to that thing about being compassionate and being kind, that these people, even though they did some pretty uh, terrible things in our history, still have a whakapapa in a genealogy of people, descendants, who that he has feelings for. Yeah. Who, um, you know, um, but I think the thing that really excites me is the fact that we are actually going to have um, uh, New Zealand history in our uh, curriculum. And I think it's a really exciting time for New Zealanders to, to morph into this beautiful identity and be complete people of this land. So I'm excited about it. Do we tear them down? Um, maybe, and maybe it's too early. And maybe if we all understand the stories, there'll be a different uh, feeling around that. You know? I, I was thinking, and I'm not sitting on the thing. It's a big thing. You know, I was thinking about the same thing this morning. For those people who are watching, and, and Pio, I know you've got us on your phones. So it'll be pretty small for you. But this is the statue we're talking yeah. about in, uh, in yeah. Hamilton. Um, this is the stuff article. Yeah. People want to check it out as well. Um, I yeah. was thinking about it this morning. I guess because this conversation of statues coming down is sort of started in America with the slave owners and you know the the people yeah. who are Confederate heroes being torn down. And I thought, bear with me. It's a bit of a long thought and it's a bit long winded. I can be that way. But at some point we disagree with each other but we all agree at the extreme sort of thing so if there was a confederate slave owner who had a statue in america and he had a noose in his hand and he was standing on the head of a slave everyone would want that gone yeah. and so then you go yeah. down so you remove the noose and he's got a head on a slave do you still want it gone probably okay so he hasn't got his foot on the on the slave but he's just standing there do you want it gone so what it comes down to is where in that line people think, yeah, we should tear this down. Um, I was also listening to a commentary about, um, oh gosh, what's that one? There's a very classic movie. I was going to say Wind in the Willows. It's not Wind in the Willows. It's an American classic. No, no, no. It's, uh, Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind. And, Gone and, with the wind. and that being yeah. taken down from places because of historical inaccuracies and that, and the argument going on about do we put a caveat at the front of it saying, this was from a certain time at a certain place and use it as an educational opportunity or do we just delete it like it mm. never happened and i think that's the conversation do we use it as an educational opportunity do we delete it like it never happened because look at television programs that were making that made in the 60s and 70s and 80s compared to what's acceptable today and you could say exactly the same yeah. thing soon there'll be no tv shown on our screens before anything made in 2010 and my philosophy on this has always been and i think about people like um Gosh, I'm not doing good with my names today. He jumped out of my head. Um, comedian who got um, fired from doing the Oscars because of my homophobic tweets he made. Anyway, I, I Kevin, Hart. Kevin Hart. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I yeah, that was my son who contributed to that. <laughs> thank you, son. Um, I always think, yeah. I always think, judge me, judge me on any laws I've broken in the past. So you know, mm. you look at the kind of Jeffrey Epstein's and these horrific things. If I broke laws 20 years ago and you judge me by those and hold me accountable, but standards of 20 years ago, it's much harder and I'm much more uncomfortable people being held to account for the standards of 20 or 30 or 50 years ago today because yeah, yeah. they didn't know any better and they weren't necessarily doing stuff out of malice. They were living their lives based on that era. And now... Of that time. And, and now... Um, to say, I mean, like I, Eddie Murphy is one of my favourite stand-ups in the world. You watch Delirious yeah. when he's talking about, you know, gay people on the on the roof of the of the car going woo woo, and you cringe and you go, that couldn't be, that's terrible. But that's still considered one of the greatest stand-up sessions of all times. Yeah. You don't judge him on what yeah. was acceptable there. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I know what you mean, and I've had the same problem in my career as well. Uh, I just want to go back a bit. Um, w when we go to these monuments, um, um, I personally don't like them, okay, um, because I know the stories of them and they hurt me. Yeah. But I don't want to tear them down because I'm angry, and I want them to be used as a lever for education. Sure. Okay. So we can tear them down and all the rest of it, and and some of the stories are, you know, there's a 
there's the there's there's a guy in uh, Otahu who was something who was responsible in the land wars for burning a church with Maori um, a Maori men and women and children in it. You know, I, I don't want to see it, but I don't want to burn it down and just I don't want to pull it down and tuck it away. I want us to have the conversation about that yep. and have the conversation that you and I are having. You see, when I was doing comedy um, or entertainment. I couldn't, could, if, if there was a Billy T. James fan club, yeah. I would want to be the chairman, right. okay? I would want to be the chairman. But I couldn't do that stuff because of the way I was brought up. Because I, my father would be rolling in his grave and says, don't push those stereotypes, right? okay? Because a lot of our beautiful Pākehā whānau, you know, where did I get my bag? I pinched it. Yeah, I mean, a lot of your beautiful whānau go, rem- well, that's pretty well rem- right, mate. Those I rem- bloody, bloody Māori are all things. I remember that. That is not a sandpit. Yeah. That is not a sandpit that I will play in and never will because for me, being Māori is like wearing the all-black jersey and you don't take the piss out of the jersey, okay? So, and people will say, oh, you're too PC and all the rest of it, bro. Well, that's my choice. Yeah. Okay. That's my choice and my integrity of who I am as a Māori and the way I was brought up. So um, I think it's really exciting and interesting times. And even with this new show that we're going to air, we were filming with a bunch of guys last night, awesome bunch of guys, and most of the conversation was, oh, gee, we can't say that now. Oh, can you? Can we say that? Oh, All right. Can't say that. So, it's, you know, we're navigating very interesting times. But as you say, bro, let Aroha be your guide, eh? Be kind. Yeah, totally. And 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 look, not not I say, take Jacinda's lead. She's the one that coined that. Let's give credit where credit's due for that one. I wonder if this no, like, we'll take it. this uh, this Captain Hamilton situation, Captain Hamilton in Hamilton. Um, I wonder if. You know, there's that old adage that the winners write the history. I wonder if uh, what needs to be done rather than tearing down Captain Hamilton is lifting up some of the other figures to paint a full picture of what was going on. Because I, I tend to agree with you. It would be it would be wrong to eliminate Captain Hamilton from history, not because, as you say, he's a I'm a fanboy of his, but he is a part of, you know, Aotearoa's history and yeah, our yeah. path and our walk. And we need to know, just like, for example, Auschwitz is still standing, they haven't raised it to the yes. ground. It's still there. Yes. You can still walk inside it. And who who possibly would think that's a good thing? You know, but it's still there as a teaching tool. Um, so yeah, maybe rather yeah. than oh. tearing down one these these guys who did did wrong, lifting up those that did right and have other statues in the same area explaining different parts of the culture and explaining why that dude over there got it wrong. Well, Māori were never given the chance to write the history in its true light, okay? And and I've always been, I've always asked this question, what is the Māori brand in New Zealand? Yep. Is our brand in good shape? Who's in charge of our brand? You know, they're interesting conversations. Now, if you and I were on the board of, mm-hmm. or on the committee of, we're going to tend tear down the monuments committee okay and you were on the board of and we go through and have all the conversations all the conversations talk to iwi talk to people at the end of our conversation we might go bro we need to tear this down yeah but at least we've had the conversation yeah and the public have had the conversation and it comes from a place of um you know of being informed eh? so the conversation is really important to me and education is really important to me yeah, I think that's really, I think that's a really good point. And this, I mean, again, I don't want to make it sound like I'm standing up for Captain Hamilton's statue, but it seems that there was a threat made to tear it down. So the council went, fine, 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 we'll take it down. No conversations been happening about that particular. Yeah, no, always particular have the corridor, bro. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fascinating. Do you do you ever do you keep an eye on what's going on in America? Do you is that something that interests you at all? Like especially at the moment with the whole Black Lives Matter movement and the marches, is that something that you keep an eye on? Yeah, I'm I'm a bit of a news hog, eh? You know, my my day starts at uh, six a.m. Uh, you know, waking up with Jenny May. That didn't sound right, <laughs> but you know, but with the breakfast crew, yeah, I'm, I'm a John Campbell. <laughs> I know her husband's a mate of mine. It's okay, but um, and I want to know what's going, and I also like to know what the weather is. But yeah, uh, um, and there's been some really interesting comments made, and if you take them with an intelligent mind and an open heart. New Zealand, again, we've got the location, the size, and the intelligence to change things in this world. Yeah. 
the machine's broken in America, in my opinion, and to turn that big ship around is going to take a long time. But, you know, our neighbours in Australia, bro, they've got a lot of work to do, you know? they got a lot of work to do. And when you have a family, so you go from a whānau, a family, a society, a group of people that's based on things that, that can be evil, there's a lot of work to do. And those have happened in these countries. I think, so, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm always watching. I think that with the treaty, what we have is a um, foundation oh. for doing things the right way. I mean, and I'm not saying, woohoo, treaty, not a problem, because obviously there is a lot of stuff still to work out in there. But with that treaty, at least there's a place to start that from. Whereas, for example, what you're talking about in Australia and America, they have nothing. There are some. My understanding is there are some yeah. tribes on the border of Canada and America that have a similar treaty, but uh, but there's no other place that's got the countrywide agreement. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, n- not not to downplay, um, you know, that it's not being worked out completely accurate, but at least there is that document there to to start and continue the conversation in a way that Māori can go. Well, guys. You know, uh, at the start, we kind of had this agreement, so let's at least fulfill, you know, part of this if we can. Whereas Native Americans have got nothing in oh, writing or anything to, to go back they to. Don't even, they don't even want to talk. You see, within, within a Māori world, bro, and I, I'm no expert on the treaty because I was brought up in a modern school environment, so we didn't learn about the treaty. But basically, I was told is it's a marriage between two two peoples, mm-hmm. and for Māori, we're still waiting at the altar. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. for Pākehā, yeah. they haven't really turned up yet. And for a lot of my Pākehā whānau, it's not a very safe place to delve into. So for me, I always make it a safe zone. And then you get these comments, you know, I listen to Redneck Radio sometimes, and um, and these comments about, well, you know, those Maoris, they get all this money and stuff. And I never forget when um, a great New Zealander, actually, from the South Island, a guy called Hubbard, had an organisation called Canterbury Finance. Yep. And he is a great New Zealander, bro. And he did a lot of great things. Um, But through all sorts of reasons, Canterbury Finance fell over and the government wrote a cheque out to prop it up. That cheque was bigger than every treaty settlement ever written and every treaty settlement going to be written. You know what? Not many people know that. Well, I I when I when I, I know I tell you what when I was working on ZB I hammered that exact point over and over and over and over again because it's so true it's so true it's like it's again it's one of these things when we're talking about the line the line for these monuments we all agree to a point and then we the divergence it's the same thing if something was stolen from you would you want it back we all say yes if something was stolen from yeah. your family a hundred years ago would you want it back well probably if something you know and and and, it, and actually at some point we diverge but the actual the actual basis of it we don't disagree with it so it's that classic example of well let's get to the point where we agree and then let's negotiate mm. or talk over the grey area. We all agree if something's taken yeah. from you, you should be able to get recompense or get your item back, whether it's a watch or a car or a piece of land. No one would disagree with that. The 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 the, yeah. the grey area is then in how do we do that, and and maybe even yeah. what, what's it worth or whatever. But but you know, so so I like going back to the starting from those simple that? points. How do we do that for the good of the country? It's not just the good for Māori. If Māori in good shape, this country is good shape. I was having a yarn to a beautiful old Māori gentleman from Rotorua, and he says, "Pure, it's a bit like a car. Like, so when, say, say Māori had a car. So I'm a Māori guy sitting in my car, and then the Pākehā arrive to our shores, and they go, shivers. I've just discovered this car. Yeah. Well, you haven't discovered the car because there's already somebody sitting in it. Okay. <laughs> so, so no, you didn't discover it, bro. Māori were already here. So you're sitting in the car, and then 150 years later, we go to court. Um, remember, 150 years was yesterday to a Māori. Okay? Totally. So we go to court, and the guy who's sitting on the bench, who the judge is, is the guy who stole your car. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so then we say, actually, actually, we were wrong. We stole your car. So for the next hundred years, you get the spare tire back, you get a wing mirror back, you get a wiper blade, and I just cracked up because it was an interesting analogy. I um I saw something on Instagram this morning, and I was wondering if I could find it. It was um, 
it was float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Muhammad Ali. Sorry, I don't know why names aren't working for me. I'm talking to you at the same time as I'm scrolling through to see if I can see where it was. Um, talking about, it's an American context, and obviously it's different in New Zealand, but the American context, I, I guess, is uh, the black community looking to white, whereas in New Zealand, maybe we talk about the Maori community looking to Pākehā. And um, yeah. he basically was telling a story. I think he was being interviewed by Parkinson in the UK, and um, I'm just flicking through Instagram so I can find it. Because if I can find it, I I'll, saw I'll this, play it a little bit. It's brilliant, and, I saw it. Well, look, was it black and white, wasn't it? I think so. Look, I can probably just go like this and go, um, uh, Muhammad Ali, Parkinson, black versus, was it, versus white. Was it about Jesus and the angels? All sorts of stuff. And he, he talked about all, yeah. he talked about why is everything white. Let me see if I can play a little bit of this. If it brings me video. Yeah, yeah. And see what he says. It's very funny too. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's light hearted and it's funny. Let's see what it, this comes up with. It's called "Why Is Everything White?" Have a look at this. And I always ask my mother, I say, "Mother, how come is everything white?" I say, "Why is Jesus white with blonde and blue eyes? Why is the Lord's <laughs> Supper all white men? Angels are white. Pope and the Mary and every even the angels." I said, "Mother, when we die, do we go to heaven?" She said, "Naturally, we go to heaven." I said. But what happened to all the black angels when they took the pictures? <laughs> I, said, I said, oh, I know. If the white folks was in heaven too, then the black angels were in the kitchen preparing the milk and honey. She said, listen, you quit saying that, boy. I was always curious. And I always wonder why I had to die to go to heaven. But he, goes, he, he gives numerous examples, yeah. numerous examples. Here's yeah. one, another one. Yeah, why is Tarzan white? And all the Africans, so he's beating them up and breaking the lion's jaw. And here's Tarzan talking to the animals. And the Africans been there for centuries, and he yet can't talk to the animals. Only Tarzan can talk to the animals. Anyway, he gives 20 or 30 <laughs> examples. The angel food cake was the white cake, and the devil food cake was the chocolate cake. Yeah, that's a good one. Angel food cake is the white cake. The, de the, the devil cake is the black cake. So similar thing. Uh, it's it's yeah. like all these... All these um, I've, I mean, like, I, I, it's maybe the day and age we're working in now. You kind of go, it's difficult to know what's a, what's a joke and what's not. But even I've even heard people talk about playing eight ball. You know how the white cue ball is the white one, yeah. and it dominates all the colours. Yeah. And it's it's yeah, yeah. it's just a the the idea of money to Māori, especially over settlements, is it just makes me think of that idea that w our community is only as strong as the weakest are doing. You know, the chain is yeah. as strong as the weakest link. Those in society, judge we should be judging society by the, the least or those that are doing the worst. And on all our, you know, statistical issues, Māori are at the bottom of the pile. So if, if Māori yep. can get raised up, then by definition, the whole of society is, is better. And I've always wondered, I've, yeah, still I, I've always wondered, I've never done this, I've never seen this research, but I've always wondered, especially if we look at our prison populations, Māori are well overrepresented in the prison populations, and I've always wondered. I would like to see the research on um, wealth and the prison population. Are the majority of Māori in uh, like are they disproportionate in prison because they're Māori, or are they disproportionate in prison because of the wealth gap? In other words, if you looked at the uh, the Caucasian, the Pakeha people in Māori, are they disproportionately poor as well? So what I'm saying is, is the basis of the trouble in New Zealand with negative impacts, is it more of a race issue, Māori, first, or is it more of a wealth issue? And because Māori make up most of that capacity, it comes out as Māori. So would um, giving Māori or getting Māori to a better point financially help everything or not? Now, I'm, I don't know the answer to that, but it's always been something I've wondered. I've, I've got an answer. I've got an answer. Cool. And I want to take it away from a fiscal solution to a spiritual solution. Um, you cannot be successful if you have a if if you have a por a poverty of spirit. Okay? A poverty of spirit. So when your language is suppressed, when your home is suppressed, when you're going to high school and I was put in the dummies class and um, you know you should take woodwork instead of physics and I've done relatively well in my in my life. When you kill the spirit of a people, that's the wealth that really matters. Right. Okay. And that's the wealth 
that, and I spend a bit of time in, in, in prisons talking to, unfortunately, my whanau, and um, they don't even know what being a Māori is. Being a Māori, you know, my, I was blessed with a father of great wisdom. He says, Pio, don't run around thinking you're better than people, but run around thinking you're just as good. So I didn't have a poverty of spirit. Right. I knew my real. I knew where I came from. Now, to some races in the world, that's not important. But for Māori to grow and build, and it's actually a common denominator right across the world with Indigenous peoples. Okay, we're labelled. So if you look at School C, 50% had to fail. Yeah, the bell curve. And, and that's the start. And that's the start. I wasn't brought up with the poverty of spirit, neither are my children, and we're doing just fine. A lot of the answers actually uh, are, are in for our people as Māori, because I can walk in your Pākehā world, bro, no worries, and have done, and I love it. I celebrate our diversity in this country. But our Pākehā whānau can't work in my world, and until that sort of happens to at least some degree, we're not going to have this magic country that we think we live in. Yeah. And it's about sharing knowledge in a good way. It, it makes me think, have you seen, there's a, a clip going around at the moment by a group called David Jones Media, uh, Kimberly Jones, and she and she finishes this talk. She's in a part of, uh, urban part of America, where she's talking about why some people are burning down their own neighbourhoods, and she basically says, yeah. we, we don't own any of this, none of this is ours. You know, and, and she talks yep. about 400 years of oppression and she talks about 400 years and she equates it to playing Monopoly. If we did 400 rounds of Monopoly and every time we finished a game, I had to give you everything. And, you know, and then for the next 50 years, when I started doing well in Monopoly, you then burnt all my things down. And she finishes it. Um, sure, I could probably play it a little bit. I'm sure this would be fine as well. She finishes it talking about and w what I hear you talking about uh the the phrase you use being as good as not better than talks to me of sort of being yeah. e equal to and she finishes it by yeah. saying something really powerful I, I'm, I am going to play the last couple of seconds of this we'll let you have, have a listen to this as well sure bro have a listen broke the contract so your target your hall of fame as far as I'm concerned they could burn this bitch to the ground and it still wouldn't be enough and they are lucky that what black people are looking for is equality and not revenge. Yeah, wow, that's big. Yeah. Quality and not revenge. E equality that's and not so revenge. Cool. Yeah, that's on our yeah, Facebook page. Yeah. People want to see it. It's on our Facebook page. And she just goes, and look, I mean, I think everyone's going to kind of go, oh, burning down your own community. I don't know. But I showed this to my kids and I was like, um, I want to let you understand why some people believe what they believe and why some people are taking these actions. Others will say yeah. you should never do that, but here is a here is here is at least a part of the conversation. And I didn't put it in front of my kids saying this is the answer. I went just understand why they're thinking about this. And she does a very good example of, you know, that monopoly game. You know, basically for four hundred and fifty rounds, they're getting screwed over. And now they now everyone's saying yeah. now let's all be the same. But that point about that they want equality and not revenge. Is I was yeah. like, oh, you know, like tears. Oh, it was, it was, it was, it was moving. Yeah. Bro, I want my treaty partners, who are my whānau, right? My Pākehā whānau. Whānau to me is not just about bloodlines; it's about relationships. Mm. And my non-Māori whānau are an integral part of my life and my well-being. And I want them, and they do to be complete citizens of this land and know all the stories of this land so we as a partnership can make this land rock and roll, bro. That's how I see yeah. it. It's not about division. It's about aroha and, 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 and sharing. Um, I used to constantly tell my lovely, lovely 60-year-old plus white talkback listeners when I was working on ZB, I used to tell them, I mean, look at, look at my ridiculous beard. Let me move my mic. It's ginger, you know. It's like you can see the Celtic literally seeping out of my, out of my pores, you know, li like literally, ridiculously. I talk about I'm so white, I'm almost pale blue, you know. It's this Celtic blood that I've got. Um, but I would say to my lovely 65 year old white talkback listeners that the Māori story yes. is a is my story. It's part of my story too, not by bloodline, but I, right. I'm part of this country. That's right. So if I'm part of this that's country, right. that's part of my story, and I wanted to that's own it and I have agree. it. 
And when you were talking before about tourism, I didn't say this in, but just to jump backwards, the other thing I would constantly say is, actually, if you think about what makes us unique as New Zealanders, people always talk about, oh, you know, New Zealand, we're not Australia, and we're not South Africa, and we're not, you know, England. It's like, actually, the, the Māori culture and our, and, our, and our collective Māori history is the thing that mm. makes us unique. You don't, you don't, totally. you don't sit in the middle of a pub in London and talk about, um, you know, when the when the All Blacks are playing and talk about the four by two mentality or the number eight wire thing that that Kiwis often yeah. talk about. You do a haka, you know. That's what people do, and yeah. it's like until we yeah. who are not Māori they do it right. Yeah, yeah, true. Uh, that we who you are not Māori... Right. Not, don't do it when you're pissed. <laughs> yeah. Until we that, who are not Māori accept that the Māori story is a part of our story, it's, we're yeah. not going to move forward. But that's how I kind of feel, and that's what I try and pass on to my kids and stuff. It's like, you know, your your father, your grandfathers are from England, your grandmother's side are from Ireland, but you're a Kiwi. You were born of this land, and yeah. and, the, and these, these people who have been in this ground for a lot longer than us, uh, their story is part of our story. Because we're here, we're Kiwi, we're part yeah, of New totally. Zealand. I, I belong to a culture that's very warm and inviting, um, because you know, and and history shows this the way we 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 you know a lot of settlers wouldn't have survived here without Maori, you know, feeding them totally. and looking after them. And we could go on about this, and I'd like to have another chat to you about this whole thing about what is Kiwi yep. at another time. But um, but you mentioned, and and I'm going to have to go soon, bro. But you mentioned I have incredible faith in our tamariki, in your kids, and my mokopuna, that they're going to find this really easy to have this conversation without a backpack full of crap yeah. that but that earlier generations have, have got. You know, I, I'm really excited about the future of this country um, based around education, conversation, and aroha and understanding. Jeez, I sound like Bishop Tamaki, and I don't want to sound like that. <laughs> I saw I, <laughs> There's I, I googled you. Well, wrap up now, but I googled you you today because I wanted to do your photo, and I saw. Tell me if this is true because this is hilarious. Something about from three or four years ago where you said uh, it was so cold. I saw Bishop Tamaki putting his hand into his own pockets. Did you? Was that a quote from you? Did you say that? It's because it's attributed it's actually, to you. It, yeah, I was actually opening a, a centre in Hamilton, yeah. which is called <laughs> Kitty Kitty Roa, uh, for Tainui. And it was actually a time, bro, when Sir Paul Reeves, this amazing Māori New Zealander, passed away. It actually snowed on the Bombays, and it snowed at my boys' school in St. Peter's in Auckland here. Yep. And um, I got up there, and you know, you've got to get them. In, and I says, mate, it's so cold. I saw Bishop Tamaki. He had his hands in his own pockets. <laughs> then I looked out the corner of my eye, and his wife was there. <laughs> and she's one of my relations. But we can talk about him at another time. Bro, I've really enjoyed this. Yeah, and I love this conversation. And I love the waka that you guys create for this for this conversation. Hey, P.O., you're a legend. Thanks for joining us, man. God bless you, brother. Ka kite.